I'm uh, Kurt Campbell from Mount Sinai, and I'll be talking about biomarkers. And feel free to interrupt as I go along. We're not an enormous group, but I think with a lot of the attention to these protein spilling disorders that we care so much about, it's very important for us to understand the sort of heterogeneity, right, that these individual diagnoses have, right? When, when patients get diagnosed with IgA nephropathy or FSGS, um, it's really based on the histology. It's a biopsy read, right? Uh, it doesn't really tell you as much about the underlying disease process, the complex genetics, and individual makeup of each individual patient that will kind of determine the response to treatment, right? Or will they explain why some patients have a more aggressive course versus others having one that's more slowly progressive. So this is where biomarkers can come in handy, and there are different types of biomarkers that we'll be talking about. <clears throat> So, you know, I'll sort of give an overview of what biomarkers are, um, how we use them, some of the classic ones in the kidney space, and some of the, new, the emerging approaches, right? What would the future potentially look like? Uh, so I'll start off with, with just a case presentation that we'll come back to later on. This is a patient that we saw in our practice uh, at Mount Sinai, a gentleman with biopsy-proven membranous nephropathy in this case. We came for follow-up. Uh, you know, he'd been feeling well, uh, you know, in a clinical uh, remission. He'd been treated with uh, cyclosporin rituximab. You know, again, you know, repurposed agents, as we know, you know, not specifically developed for this uh, indication, but was feeling overall uh, well on his Losarta and angiotensin receptor blocker. Kidney function uh, was, was normal. He had less than a gram of protein in the urine, which is very good uh, for membranous. Uh, however, you know, we did a, a routine uh, biomarker uh, assay at the phospholipase A2 receptor titer, and that was elevated, right? Uh, so it was previously undetectable in this patient. So we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what this means for this patient and, and, and what we did. So, you know, what is a biomarker, right? So it's really defined as a, a characteristic that's, that's measured um, uh, that could indicate a normal biological process, pathogenic process, or response to treatment or intervention over time, right? So, you know, we, we classically think of these as, as molecular, histologic, radiographic, or physiologic. And some examples that we are very uh, familiar with in the clinical setting would include, say, blood glucose or a tumor size in, in patients with a malignancy or, or blood pressure, right? Uh, and that can have a meaning for different clinical diagnoses. Uh, and there are different types of biomarkers, right? Some of them uh, are diagnostic, helping us to make appropriate diagnosis or, or monitoring uh, treatment course. Uh, so, some can be predictive and, and could tell us uh, which patients are more likely to develop uh, a disease over time. Prognostic, um, you know, helping us to, to define uh, the, the risk of disease progression over time. And susceptibility ones, including genetic markers, uh, and also safety, right, how we monitor uh, the response or safety in a drug profile. So, you know, in the, in the kidney space, you know, one of the examples of a, a prognostic a biomarker is the kidney volume, right, and in patients with polycystic kidney disease. And, and that's been, uh, you know, sort of uh, one of the more widely accepted uh, markers of, of disease progression risk, right? When patients have a, a large kidney volume, uh, usually on CAT scan or MRI, uh, that actually is one of the very predictive and, and prognostic uh, tools that we use clinically. And, you know, ultimately some of these uh, biomarkers uh, can become surrogate endpoints that are useful in a clinical trial setting, right? Uh, and uh, this is coming back to the discussion around uh, proteinuria and protein spilling, right? Uh, where we'll talk about this reasonably likely surrogate definition for proteinuria in IgA nephropathy, right, which enabled, uh, you know, drug development uh, to move forward at, at the current uh, pace that it is. And there are other candidate uh, surrogate endpoints again, that could um, help you estimate or, or correlate with the risk of progression of a particular disease or success for treatment that are under investigation uh, within this space. So, you know, in the uh, kidney space, uh, you know, a lot of the biomarkers that, that we use uh, are, um, you know, injury or structural related proteins for various parts of the kidney, including the, the glomerulus or tubular segments, you know, creatinine, uh, albumin, of course, uh, and, and the glomerulus uh, are highly relevant to the uh, disorders that, that we are discussing today. Um, and of course, have an implication for us estimating kidney function or um, correlating with 
uh, injury, right, uh, to the glomerulus uh, in the setting of these protein spilling disorders. And of course, these glomerular disorders are on a spectrum, right? Some of them are more uh, inflammatory with an intense um, inflammatory cell infiltrate. Others, um, you know, are uh, more degenerative, if you, if you will, where you lose podocytes. And, and Josh showed some beautiful uh, podocyte pictures uh, early on. But, you know, how we distinguish and diagnose these and, and, and track disease progression is something that we often uh, struggle with. And the classic approach that we use, you know, again, in addition uh, to kidney function is, is measuring how much protein or blood there is in the urine, right? So it's not a normal finding uh, to have blood or protein uh, within the urine. It really tells us uh, that there is injury uh, to this filtration barrier, right? Uh, this barrier that's keeping um, these molecules within the blood. And so whether um, it's an inflammatory injury or a genetic process um, uh, or, you know, um, uh, other toxic or hemodynamic injury, uh, you're not uh, expected to identify uh, blood and protein. And this is the first clue that we have that there is a disease process that's ongoing. And of course, the glomerular filtration rate, again, th this is something we estimate based on an increased level of creatinine, right, uh, in the blood, right? And this is a muscle breakdown product that's normally freely filtered. So when there's an elevated level, it tells us that the kidney function uh, is decreased. And again, it's important because, you know, again, th these are markers, right? In the clinical setting, we're not actually measuring kidney function. There are ways to do this in a more accurate, invasive manner. Um, so we're really getting a ballpark measure, right, of what the kidney function is or how much injury there is, right, uh, with the level of blood and protein in the urine. So in essence, we use biomarkers all the time, right, in the clinical setting, right? Uh, and, you know, we, we also have to take a detailed history, um, you know, for some of these nephrotic disorders, right, with heavier levels of protein uh, in, in the urine, um, you know, we can do genetic testing, um, you know, rule out uh, infectious correlations, uh, as well as, you know, other emerging uh, biomarker profiles and serologic studies. And the same thing goes uh, for the more inflammatory conditions uh, as well. There, there are a number of uh, immunologic studies, sero serologic tests that we can, um, you know, uh, uh, run, you know, from complement levels to anti-nuclear antibodies, and, and this will give us a clue as to what the diagnosis is, right? So if we're suspecting lupus uh, nephritis in a patient who has a known um, you know, uh, a diagnosis of, of, of systemic lupus erythematosus, uh, then we would perform certain standard uh, tests that would point towards lupus nephritis uh, being the diagnosis. But ultimately, we do need a kidney biopsy, especially in adults. You know, in the pediatric setting, the approach may be a little bit different. So again, some of the data clues, is the creatinine uh, normal? Is there blood in the urine? How much protein is there? You know, what's the serum albumin, right? Uh, uh, and that also gives us a clue, and also the serologies. So the serum albumin really helps us distinguish, again, some of the primary versus secondary etiologies. Um, but, and a low, very low serum albumin can increase the risk uh, of um, uh, developing uh, clots and thromboses, right? Uh, so that's, that's a very clear marker. And the serum albumin actually uh, can increase uh, during the course of successfully treating patients uh, with uh, nephrotic uh, syndrome. The urinalysis helps us, right? Uh, we, um, and you know, I think this is another reason it's important uh, that, that um, any time we suspect uh, a glomerular disease, uh, that the patients see a nephrologist sooner rather than later, because you know, this detailed workup doesn't necessarily happen uh, in the primary care setting, and, and as, as Josh mentioned, uh, doesn't always happen in the general nephrology practice, right? So it's also important for glomerular disease specialists to, to see patients, right? Um, so the urinalysis can tell us quite a bit. Uh, it, it is not uncommon to have blood in the urine, but how do you know that it's um, you know, from the glomerulus, right? Or even the kidney for that matter, right? How do we know that it's not from the bladder, right? Or a lower GU source, right? Uh, um, and this, again, requires us to usually spin the urine down, you know, look for any red cells that are damaged because as they go through the kidney, they get damaged, right? Uh, they don't look normal when they come out in the urine. So, you know, uh, we, we um, can find casts. We can find what we call dysmorphic red cells. That'll tell us, you know what, this is likely from the kidney and we need to look for glomerular disease, maybe IgA nephropathy or, or one of these other conditions, right? Uh, but, you know, otherwise, you know, we partner with our urology colleagues to do a lower GU workup quite often. 
But ultimately, we do need, uh, again, especially in adults, to do a kidney biopsy. And uh, this um, uh, procedure has gone through uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know, twists and turns over the last several decades. And you know, the first kidney biopsy was actually done in the 1950s. And, and the, usually, it was done blind. In the modern era, we um, are using uh, CT scan or ultrasound uh, guidance. Um, there are classic indications for a kidney biopsy in, in, um, in adults, uh, especially if you have nephrotic uh, syndrome or, or nephritic syndrome or um, unexplained chronic kidney disease, um, any systemic uh, uh, disorders where you suspect um, kidney uh, involvement uh, would be uh, indications. And the, the other interest, interesting point is that nephrologists often are surprised by the diagnosis that's made on the kidney biopsy. It's, it's really about uh, uh, 40%, 40 to 50% of the time that nephrologists are, are correct right, in predicting what the diagnosis will be after the, the, the biopsy is done, which is interesting, right? Uh, and you know, more than 30% of the time, that actually changes the management, right? So it's really arguing for more kidney biopsies to be done. And unfortunately, in many centers, the threshold is really a bit too high. This is, again, another uh, plug for, for Josh's point earlier about uh, seeing uh, specialists in glomerular disease where kidney biopsies are, are done a lot more uh, frequently. And a little bit of food for thought um, is, is that um, the clinical manifestations, the blood in the urine, the, the protein in the urine, um, the increased creatinine, that actually happens after um, damage is done, right, at the tissue level uh, in the kidney, right? Um, this is a study on, on um, patients with, um, with, with lupus uh, who had normal kidney function and no blood or protein in the urine, and a lot of them actually on, on biopsy had uh, inflammation uh, seen that required treatment uh, on their biopsy. So it's, it's really, you know, us again having imperfect biomarkers, blood, you know, protein, uh, decreased kidney function, imperfect biomarkers of kidney damage. And this is why it's so important for our research uh, uh, efforts to uh, be enhanced to develop more sensitive markers, right? Uh, because it doesn't tell you the, the full picture. And we also saw this, this was a, a study uh, that we did um, in, in mice um, in an FSGS model where we could show uh, that the podocytes were injured uh, before, when you do electron microscopy and kind of um, uh, estimate uh, podocyte injury, that happens before the, the, the mice actually get uh, significant protein in the urine. So, you know, structural changes happen before you actually see the clinical or phenotypic manifestation. Uh, and, and a similar thing, you know, is seen in, in, in Fabry's uh, uh, disease, right, where, um, you know, again, over time, you do get this accumulation, right, uh, of um, uh, abnormal proteins and in, in, in podocytes. Uh, but interestingly, that accumulation happens and podocyte injury happens. All these, um, you know, subclinical damage is ongoing long before you actually see protein in the urine or the kidney function decreasing. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'll kind of skip over the kidney biopsy uh, basics. Um, we routinely um, do light microscopy, electron microscopy, immunofluorescence in the U.S. I mean, we're a higher resource country. In many other countries, um, it's a stepwise process, right, where special stains or electron microscopy, that's not routinely done. Um, for cost reasons, for avail availability reasons. So, you know, on a global scale, we have to really consider ourselves to be very fortunate. But one of the basic um, you know, uh, instruments we, we have is to really assess uh, what the kidneys and the glomerular look like on light microscopy. And uh, this is a, 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 what we call a PS, a periodic acid shift staining, which looks a lot you know, like a cartoon of the glomerulus and, and where the, the tubules actually start, the, the primary urinary filtrate. So we, we look for abnormalities um, on light microscopy as a first step, right? Uh, and then we, we proceed. Um, but as I'll uh, point out, uh, this is really scratching the surface, uh, looking at histologic changes. These are just, again, you know, some of the um, abnormalities that we can see with special stains. There are stains for um, you know, uh, measuring uh, how, how much scarring or fibrosis there is, um, as well as um, other stains for the basement membrane to see really how thick it is, for example. <laughs> 
So this is the, the barrier, again, for protein loss um, that you can see on electron microscopy. It's, a, it's a, another view of, of podocytes, as Josh showed earlier. This is like transmission EM. And you see these cells are normally these foot processes sitting on this basement membrane. Um, and this is sort of the blood side here, the basolateral part. This is the apical surface, which is where urine is. So the podocytes are really bathed in urine constantly. Uh, and they're really preventing protein from crossing into the urine, in addition to being a complex signaling platform. Um, you know, they get injured and, and effaced and flattened and, and fall off during the course uh, of disease, and, and that's a descriptive um, term of foot process effacement uh, that we classically see uh, during the course of uh, protein spilling disorders. So this is what things would look like uh, during effacement. And, and you know, almost universally when, when um, there's a lot of protein in the urine, we would see um, this, this effacement being described uh, by the pathologist. And, and so there, there are also deposits that we can see uh, which would be indicative of you know, this immune mediated uh, processes. You know, how much effacement there is, there's been a, a lot of uh, interest uh, in that, uh, um, you know, as we try to figure out if we should give immunosuppression to patients who have, say, FSGS. Turns out if you, if you have a very low serum albumin and very high levels of protein in the urine and you have this diffuse foot process effacement, uh, that suggests that there may be a more immune-mediated um, underlying uh, etiology as opposed to one that's genetic, right? And again, um, that's not uh, you know, a, a, a full proof uh, way of approaching this, but again, just thinking about markers uh, that we can utilize histologically, that makes a big difference, right? Uh, because you know, as I'll show you, if there's a genetic etiology or a secondary cause or an immunologic cause, you can think about the different ways you should uh, offer treatment based on what the etiology is. So yeah, this is kind of what I was, what I was getting to. And, and uh, uh, Fervenza at, at Mayo uh, has put forward uh, this hypothesis um, of how you can distinguish primary, you know, which, which should be, again, a more you know, fulminant, acute onset, massive amounts of protein in the urine presentation with these diffuse food process effacement um, th that you would not see in, in other etiologies. You know, immunofluorescence, another marker of how we can um, define um, what the underlying pathogenesis is. So we can do a lot of, uh, you know, specialized uh, stains uh, for different immunoglobulins and complement factors, and, and the pattern of staining can tell us uh, quite a bit uh, as well. Um, and ultimately, again, making the right diagnosis is, as you can imagine, very uh, crucial. So these are just some uh, of the different uh, antibodies that we can apply uh, on immunofluorescence. And you know, they're emerging um, you know, stains that we can apply, like um, uh, DNH B9 for fibrillary glomerulonephritis. So it's, it's, it's a, a novel way that we can uh, identify some of these rare um, you know, glomerulonephritis diagnoses uh, uh, with stains. And, and again, this is work uh, uh, developed that may and validated in, in many other centers. So, you know, after this diagnosis, right, is made, I, I think that's really just the first step because I think in this era, we really have to move towards a precision-based approach, and I think that's where the field uh, is going. Um, and as I mentioned, FSGS, right, uh, again, one of, one of the, the more uh, uh, common uh, primary uh, glomerular diseases that we encounter, it's really a description, right, that you're uh, describing. It's, it's really called focal because some glomeruli uh, are affected and not all, and it's segmental because the ones that are affected uh, tend to have a portion that looks relatively healthy. You can see this, right? It's a segmental scar uh, that, that you can see uh, in, in this glomerulus, and when you, you look at it on lower power, the glomerulus here looks pretty normal, while others look scarred to varying degrees. So you're describing a histologic pattern of injury, but it's, it's again, it's not a disease. It's not a, a, an ultimate diagnosis. There's still a lot more work uh, that we should be doing. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's really telling us that that scar is impairing the ability of that nephron to function appropriately, right? Uh, um, you know, filtration decreases. This is why ultimately the kidney function can decrease. And, uh, you know, th there are so many different etiologies uh, for FSGS, and this is actually an, an older table, just looking at the, 
you know, hemodynamic stress that happens on podocytes that can cause that lesion to appear. Uh, different infections have been associated with that lesion appearing, genetic etiologies, um, toxins, ischemia, the aging process itself, you lose podocytes over time and that segmental scar can develop. Uh, so, you know, we, we can't stop at saying, oh, it's FSGS, right? It's sort of like, well, what's causing it, right? That, that has to be the, the, the next uh, question. And, you know, IgA nephropathy, you know, again, um, very, um, you know, important. Uh, this is the most uh, uh, common primary glomerulonephritis in the world, right? Uh, and fortunately, no, we, we have a lot of, um, uh, you know, activity in developing precision-based treatments. But again, you know, it is really describing uh, this pattern, right, of um, um, IgA deposits. So this is like standing for IgA on immunofluorescence. The immunoglobulin is IgA, right, uh, um, you know, in, in the glomerulus. And you do have mesangial deposits of this uh, that you see on electron microscopy. And on light microscopy, there are areas of um, mesangial cell proliferation and um, uh, matrix, right? Uh, the scarring pattern that, that's a bit different in appearance uh, from FSGS, right? So, you know, I think, you know, decades ago, we, we would have likely have stopped and said this is IgA, but we know IgA nephropathy, again, has a lot of different clinical presentations. It can be slowly progressive, rapidly progressive, massively nephrotic, and we know that there are you know, genetic etiologies um, uh, th that may increase susceptibility, um, so it it's another interesting uh, one, right? So let's talk a little bit about proteinuria, um, kidney function, and uh, uh, prognosis, right? Because you know, how much protein there is in the urine, um, what the kidney function is like at the time of diagnosis and biopsy can have a big impact, right, ultimately on prognosis and the response uh, to, to treatment. So IgA nephropathy in particular, right, this is the, um, the, the glomerular disease that, that really um, has the closest correlation uh, of proteinuria with the progression, right? Uh, if more than half a gram, um, and, and some studies would say a gram of protein is in the urine, the risk of kidney function decline over time starts to increase significantly, right? So you can see just the stepwise um, uh, decline in renal survival. And we usually consider renal survival to be like a 40 to 50% decline in, in kidney function or the need for dialysis or transplant, right? But, but just the poor prognosis, just, just in a stepwise manner, um, just gets worse and worse, um, depending on the degree of proteinuria. And, and, and it, again, that, that threshold where things start to get bad is the lowest for IgA, right? It's really the most serious uh, one where you have to really pay a lot of attention to how much protein there is in the urine. Um, you know, for um, FSGS, this is, uh, this, is, this is an FSGS um, uh, uh, table. It's a little bit different, right? For this, it's really the, the nephrotic range. More than three grams is where the prognosis becomes really bad. And of course, if it's more than 10 to 14, um, then it's even worse, right? But the threshold for FSGS um, is, is a bit higher. Um, and, and I think for FSGS, when the creatinine is elevated, the prognosis is worse uh, as well. So this is a table sort of comparing the, the different um, histologic diagnoses, IgA nephropathy, FSGS, and membranous nephropathy. Um, for patients with membranous nephropathy, um, we really don't see uh, an increased risk of disease progression unless there's more than four to five grams of protein in the urine. And we actually don't understand why that's the case for membranous, where for IgA, it's half a gram to a gram, right? It's the same albumin, it's the same protein in the urine, and yet, the prognosis, right, for this, albeit imperfect biomarker, proteinuria, is so different, and the impact on disease progression is so different, right, for these different disorders. So this is why making the right diagnosis matters uh, uh, so much. And, and I, I should mention, it doesn't necessarily help um, in the clinical setting where you can have secondary FSGS in patients with IgA nephropathy, and you can also have FSGS seen in patients with diabetic disease and membranous. So sometimes there's a blurring, right, uh, where um, the clinical diagnosis doesn't just jump out at you and we need to really do more sophisticated testing. All right, so the other thing, um, you know, with IgA nephropathy, and this is, again, uh, showing, you know, more than a gram of proteinuria at the time of diagnosis, the prognosis is worse, right, uh, that, that we showed before. What's interesting for IgA nephropathy is that if you reduce the proteinuria to less than a gram, 
it's almost like it was less than a gram to begin with. And that's good, right? This is actually, you know, one of the, the, the clearest um, uh, signs, right, uh, in glomerular disease that reducing proteinuria can improve prognosis. And I think some of the best evidence we have in that regard is IJ nephropathy. And it has had, had an impact at the public health level in, in some of the policy decisions that I'll, I'll talk about. As I will talk about it now in this slide. So the Kidney Health Initiative, right, um, this public-private partnership, uh, and, and uh, you know, Josh uh, mentioned some of the, the great work NEFCURE did uh, to contribute to this, and it really was trying to uh, identify endpoints, right, uh, that could be used uh, to develop, uh, uh, you know, IgA nephropathy uh, therapy approval, right? So a critical data review happened, and based on some of the evidence that, that, that I showed and, and other evidence in the literature, it really was clear that reducing proteinuria um, is, a, is, is um, a, a, a great, um, you know, surrogate, right, uh, for improved clinical outcomes in IgA nephropathy. And, you know, the, the term, and again, if you recall that uh, surrogate endpoint slide that I had earlier, it's a reasonably likely surrogate endpoint, right? Uh, and, and of course, um, you, you heard about some of the, the success uh, with um, uh, uh, Tarpeo, uh, this um, target release budesonide um, that, um, um, you know, was the basis for accelerated approval, right? Uh, of course, clinical benefit uh, for these agents that are, are pursuing this path on the basis of Pertner has to be uh, shown in, in post-marketing confirmatory approval, but at least we do know that reducing proteinuria um, is a, is a, um, a likely uh, attractive uh, and, and, and valid uh, surrogate endpoint for IG nephropathy. And a lot of work is ongoing for FSGS uh, as well, and uh, you may have heard about this, this novel definition of partial remission. It's really hard in patients with FSGS and especially with nephrotic range proteinuria uh, to get a complete remission. It almost never happens. Um, even a partial remission under the standard definition, which was a 50% reduction uh, to you know, less than half a gram or so, that, that was also hard, right? Uh, so uh, great work. Um, you know, uh, from uh, you know, Michigan and, and uh, John Troost, uh, Deb Gibson, and many others, um, you know, showed that this novel partial remission definition of 40% re reduction in proteinuria uh, to less than 1.5 grams um, in patients who are starting from more than three um, did appear uh, to suggest that they would have a good uh, clinical prognosis, right? Uh, and, and so this is being validated in, in other studies, and so there may be hope that for FSGS, this modified definition, which may be more easily attainable, especially in a clinical trial setting, could be the basis uh, for, you know, drug approval. So there have been a lot of recent advances, um, and, and that's another piece of the good news. Uh, you know, there, there's several biomarkers. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about the phospholipase A2 receptor. You know, I mentioned uh, DINA, and I'll talk a little bit about the urine uh, EGF. But there's been an explosion. Uh, you heard uh, Josh talk earlier about uh, the easier access to um, genetics. And, um, and also we've been, and I won't get into this too much, but digital pathology, machine learning, you know, there's a lot of evidence uh, that, um, you know, machine learning can pick up uh, some of the characteristics of light microscopy and electron microscopy analyses that humans can't, like pathologists can't, right? Uh, some of the characteristics, the smoothness of certain cellular surfaces and so on that wouldn't be necessarily visible to the naked eye or, you know, wouldn't register to a human may be picked up. And you can train, right, uh, these uh, machine learning uh, models um, you know, with gold standard outcomes, right, uh, by saying, you know what, we've enriched for this pathogenic pathway or, you know, this genetic predisposition, um, you know, what would the machine pick up, right, analyzing the histology. And, and again, this is uh, in the research phase, but that's exciting, right, uh, where we can, you know, not do away with renal pathologists, but find a way uh, to help them, you know, give you more information from a kidney biopsy. So a little bit on, on genetics, and, and I won't go through you know, all the genes. Uh, as Josh said, about 60 genes, and the list keeps growing, um, of the genes that are um, associated with FSGS and uh, nephrotic syndrome. And uh, they are in different parts of the podocyte cell body, nucleus, mitochondria, lysosome, anchoring to the basement membrane, uh, and so on. Really um, diverse areas. And some of these genes 
are in pathways um, uh, that are shared, right? Uh, suggesting that you know perhaps um, some final path, common pathways can be identified that could be amenable to therapeutic uh, intervention. Uh, there is e even um, you know uh, you know metabolic genes like coenzyme Q. Uh, 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 pathways that might be amenable um, to supplementation. So that's, that's really interesting. And this has an impact on clinical outcomes, right? It used to be, um, say five years ago, when, when I used to give talks on genetics and FSGS, I'd say, you know, yes, some great research is happening. It's really hard to get genetic testing on your patients, and we don't necessarily know, you know, what to do with the information we get. It. That's, that's changing, right, uh, uh, for, for the better. Um, this is some work uh, from the University of Toronto where they looked at their patients with FSGS um, and they did whole exome sequencing to try to identify disease-causing gene mutations and they found them in about 20% uh, of, of their cohort, which is a big number, right? Um, and actually, um, you know, was, was a bit of a surprise uh, to the field and, and other um, you know, sources have, have mentioned that 20, maybe 30% or so of patients with FSGS, certainly if they're steroid-resistant FSGS, may have disease-causing uh, gene mutations. And this is not even including APOL1 or disease-modifying genes, right? These are monogenetic. This is like the gene is causing the disease directly, right? Uh, if you could correct, you know, the gene mutation, you'd think you'd be able to you know, improve uh, the clinical outcome. So this is actually, you know, very substantive. And, and uh, Moin Salim's group, um, you know, also showed uh, the, the big impact. We know that one of the, you know, sad outcomes with FSGS is how much it recurs post-transplant, right? Uh, you know, we uh, are always looking at dialysis as a bridge to transplant and have a, a sense of, you know, success and pride when a patient can get a transplant. But we used to teach, um, you know, our trainees and students that, FSGS uh, will recur in 30 to 40 percent of patients, right, who have that diagnosis pre-transplant. In the era of genetics, that's a little bit different because um, the, the Salim group showed uh, that if you have monogenetic disease, and other groups have shown this as well, um, you actually don't really get recurrence. It, the, the disease doesn't actually come back uh, uh, post-transplant, unless, of course, there's this bad, the misfortune of um, transplanting a, a kidney with you know, a mutation again, right? Uh, which, in the era of screening, that, that's unlikely to happen. Um, conversely, if the genetic panel is negative, um, the risk of recurrence is much higher. It's more like 70%, right? Um, so again, just access to genetic testing is, is changing our outlook. Um, and, you know, genetic testing is not yet widespread in transplant centers all around the world, but, I mean, these are ongoing discussions, right, in light of you know, some of uh, this data, and this, this manuscript is only about a, a year old, um, you know, so I think we're, we're learning more uh, and, and certainly will impact our clinical practice. So APOL1 I'll, I'll talk uh, a little bit about because, I mean, I think that that's certainly, you know, one of the, um, you know, more interesting and uh, exciting developments uh, in, in, in the field. And so, as we know, you know, patients uh, of African ancestry, um, you know, have a high likelihood of um, uh, APOL1-associated disease. Um, and if, if there are two high-risk uh, alleles present, then the risk of non-diabetic kidney disease is, is much higher, right, uh, in, in, in this patient population. What's interesting, though, is even patients with two high-risk alleles, um, the majority of them have no evidence of of kidney disease. It's really only about 25% of patients uh, with these alleles that actually get disease, right? So it's incompletely penetrant, um, and it, it tells us that there is likely a second hit, right? Uh, there are other things, environmental, you know, infectious, maybe other gene mutations acting in coordination uh, that would cause uh, the apoil one associated kidney disease. So a lot, a lot of work uh, ongoing uh, uh, here, um, and, you know, again, we do know that um, th there are viral infections that are uh, associated with an increased risk. Um, you know, HIV-associated nephropathy, for example, um, uh, is highly associated. And, you know, in the COVID pandemic, um, there were a, a number of um, uh, case reports, right? Um, and this was, this was from uh, New Orleans, uh, Juan Carlos Velez's group uh, that reported a, a series of six patients um, who had collapsing glomerulopathy. Um, who all had these uh, APOL1 high-risk alleles. And it, it did appear, uh, again, the interaction between this viral infection 
you know, this disease susceptibility and poor outcomes. Uh, um, unfortunately, the, the, the clinical uh, outcomes for these patients was not very good. About four of six ended up being dialysis dependent. Um, and you know, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, COVID um, and kidney disease uh, later on, but there's this inflammatory cascade, of course, that's um, a part of the disease process, um, but not necessarily direct invasion of the virus into the kidney itself. And we also had uh, a case report uh, that at Mount Sinai where the signaling downstream in the kidney tissue um, you know, looked a lot like what we'd, saw, what we'd see in patients uh, with HIV-associated nephropathy with this phosphostat-3 signaling mediator upregulated in uh, the um, glomeruli of a patient with this collapsing glomerulopathy um, who also had two high-risk APOL1 alleles. Um, and so there may be some similarities in the downstream signaling uh, in these two processes. So, you know, of course, um, uh, you, you've heard about some of the, the work that uh, Vertex uh, has, has done um, and, you know, their um, initial data that, that Josh showed uh, um, really was targeting uh, patients with APOL1-associated um, uh, FSGS, um, kind of uh, building on the hypothesis that if you have the two high-risk alleles and you have the clinical phenotype, then by definition, there likely would be that second hit that was uh, a part of the process and uh, they, they showed a reduction in a pilot uh, a study um, with, with patients having significant reduction in uh, proteinuria, right, uh, when an APOL1 inhibitor, right, was given uh, to, to, to patients with, with FSG. So, so I think there, there are other um, APOL1 inhibitors in clinical development, and again, this is one uh, path towards precision-based treatment where a patient with a specific uh, gene mutation would be eligible for a study targeting the mutant protein that's encoded by that gene, um, and there, there's a sign that this may be a good strategy, right? So again, exciting work for the field, and you know, we have 60 other genes, right, uh, uh, that could potentially be amenable in, in a similar way. So I'll talk a little bit uh, about membranous nephropathy, and, and this was really a seminal uh, paper in um, 2009 uh, from uh, Larry Beck, David Salanta at BU, which was one of the, the biggest discoveries in the nephrology uh, field ever. Um, and they identified you know, a, a subset of, of patients with biopsy-proven membranous nephropathy uh, who had expression of this phospholipase A2 receptor, right, um, um, on, on their uh, podocytes, right? So, you know, this um, was uh, seen in about 70% of patients with uh, quote-unquote primary membranous. Uh, I know there's been an explosion of literature around uh, what we have have been able to do with this uh, exceptional biomarker uh, that's enabling us not just to identify patients with membranous, uh, but follow the treatment course uh, over time, right? So even before I you know, show you some of uh, that data, um, you, know, you can imagine uh, how this may enable a diagnosis to be made even before a kidney biopsy is done, right? Uh, if you had an assay with you know, an antibody circulating in the blood, right? That's one thing. Uh, one could imagine. Um, if you make the diagnosis and you offer treatment, uh, could you predict, you know, which, which patients uh, might respond to specific treatment options? Um, could you follow them and, and, and tell when somebody's going to have a flare before they have proteinuria developing, right? As I mentioned, proteinuria is an imperfect biomarker that sometimes, sometimes lags. Um, you know, so, so I think this opens a lot of questions, right? Uh, or one day, you know, could you, um, you know, have you know, a sophisticated, you know, CAR T-cell approach, right, to sort of deplete this abnormal antibody, right, that's circulating in patients who are, um, you know, susceptible to membranous nephropathy. So it opens a lot of possibilities when you identify biomarkers uh, that are um, quite promising. So, yeah, again, this was uh, some of the, the work uh, from the, the, the Beck and, and Salant uh, group, and you could, you could see during the course of treatment, uh, they were able to develop an assay to measure um, this uh, antibody uh, against the phospholipase A2 receptor in the blood, uh, and when patients, you know, were, were nephrotic, when they had a lot of protein in the urine, the titer levels were very high. When the patients went into a remission, the titer went down, and with a relapse, it, it would come back up, right? Uh, so what you'd expect from a pretty valid biomarker. And, and there was nice correlation with proteinuria, right? So, you know, the more proteinuria the patients had, the more likely they were to have higher uh, titers of PLA2R. Uh, 
Uh, and what we're seeing now clinically is that patients with the highest levels uh, of, of, um, of this uh, biomarker may actually have the worst prognosis. I mean, they, they do have, again, higher levels of proteinuria because it correlates well. Uh, but again, you know, opening up uh, some risk stratification possibilities beyond what we normally would have. Um, and it turns out it's, it's about 70% um, uh, uh, sensitive, as I mentioned, whether it's on the histologic staining or from uh, the um, serology. And this is uh, like a Western blood as well as um, like a, a chart showing the correlation with proteinuria. And what was interesting here is that, you know, again, some patients over time have a disappearance, right, uh, of this uh, PLA2R correlating again with uh, the, the proteinuria. Um, so the PLA2R is in red uh, and the proteinuria is in blue. What you can see that's interesting is that the, the PLA2R is going down before the proteinuria would go down, right, uh, as, as you can see. And, you know, if, if patients um, have a persistence of proteinuria, they also have a persistence uh, of the biomarker. If they have a successful remission but then, you know, have a relapse, the biomarker comes up uh, and the proteinuria comes up. But, but again, it does appear that the biomarker is coming up a little bit before the protein is detectable in the urine, which is interesting. So, you know, we, we've um, been looking at, again, various, um, uh, you know, studies showing this time-dependent appearance and disappearance of this biomarker. Um, and this, this has led to um, us talking about the immunologic disease different from the clinical disease, right? Uh, so, um, you know, the, the clinical disease uh, is sort of in, in green um, and the pla 2 is immunologic. And again, if you successfully go into a remission, the pla 2 falls before the proteinuria falls. And what's interesting is that when patients are going to have a relapse, the pla 2 comes up before right, uh, the, the protein um, starts being spilled in the urine. So you can actually predict before, right, uh, that flare is apparent using standard, you know, proteinuria and other tools, who's going to go uh, into uh, a relapse. And, you know, again, some, some of the, um, the benefits that we're talking about is that there's now a proliferation of, of articles, um, some original research and, and some, um, you know, opinion pieces um, describing which patients may actually not even need a kidney biopsy anymore, right? Uh, if they have um, elevated uh, phospholipase A2 receptors and they have normal kidney function and there's no apparent secondary cause for membranous because, you know, with, with membranous nephropathy, there's an association with, with solid malignancies, for example, so age-appropriate cancer screenings and, you know, making sure that there, there's no other autoimmune disease like lupus uh, being present. Um, you know, it may be that there are patients who actually don't need a kidney biopsy since this biomarker is so good, and that discussion has been happening quite a bit. And this is a, another uh, study uh, from the, the Mayo Group really asking, again, you know, can the pla 2 r serology replace kidney biopsies in diagnosing membranous, right? So, you know, one could, could see um, how this could be applied potentially, right, uh, to other areas uh, in, in our field. Uh, but there are other, um, you know, putative um, uh, target antigens beyond PLA2R. Uh, the, you know, Bexelon group also identified thrombospondin 7A, which may explain another, you know, portion of um, the primary membranous group, and then others, NEL4, exostin one uh, there, there are other less common uh, biomarkers that have been identified as well. So what, what about some emerging biomarkers? And uh, we'll talk a little bit uh, about these. Um, so um, Matthias uh, uh, Kretzler's group uh, at, at Michigan uh, did a lot of uh, nice work, um, you know, through the um, NIH-funded uh, 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 Neptune cohort. And, and they were looking for tissue biomarkers, right, um, you know, genes and pathways that are perturbed in kidney tissue with gene transcript and their protein products being increased or decreased, um, uh, you know, on, on kidney biopsy, how they would correlate with urinary findings. And they were able to find a correlation with this uh, urinary um, uh, EGF, um, uh, epidermal growth factor. And it turns out that when patients have decreased levels uh, of EGF in the urine, the prognosis is worse, right? Uh, sort of across the spectrum of chronic uh, kidney disease. And so this is an emerging marker, um, and it's been validated by, you know, a, a group in, in, in Norway as well as the Netherlands, uh, where they were also able to show uh, that, that lower um, uh, urinary uh, EGF associated with an increased risk of rapid loss of kidney function. 
And specific, you know, for um, you know, glomerular disease, this was also seen in children with uh, nephrotic syndrome. Uh, the, the study in care reports showing uh, that this may be a marker of disease progression uh, in children with nephrotic syndrome, and you know that may also be the case uh, in, in adults. So, I mean, what, if, if this work is validated and extended, um, it, it can have a lot of implications, right? Because, you know, we may be able to give, uh, you know, patients, families, um, and, and clinicians uh, more information about which patients are more likely to have a poor prognosis beyond, again, the standard tools that we have uh, at, at available to us. Uh, we've also been working, um, you know, again, we're, we're fortunate uh, in, enough to get, you know, a pilot grant uh, as well um, uh, through, through NEFCURE and CureGN, taking advantage of what we know uh, about uh, the connection between, um, you know, protein spilling disorders, fluid retention. Uh, there is a mediator of fluid retention that may also injure podocytes that we've worked on called uh, plasminogen. Um, and we, we know that when, when activated to, to plasmin in, in the kidney tubule, uh, this is one of the ways that sodium is reabsorbed and, um, you know, patients uh, have fluid retention uh, edema uh, formation, but we're also able uh, to show uh, that by being exposed um, to podocytes, uh, plasminogen can cause uh, uh, injury directly, almost as a second hit. So, you know, protein is being spilled from a genetic or inflammatory or other etiologies, and then podocytes get exposed to plasminogen, which we think exacerbates the problem and may cause you know, more uh, kidney uh, function uh, decline. So you know, we're able to show, we're able to grow uh, human podocytes in culture uh, and you know, at baseline, you know, they look pretty normal, they have nice focal adhesions, a nice actin cytoskeletal architecture, but when uh, plasminogen is added to these podocytes, they lose the focal adhesions, uh, and you know you can. There are inhibitors, um, imperfect inhibitors, uh, in use for plasminogen. Amiloride, it's actually an antihypertensive uh, that can partially rescue uh, the phenotype uh, of plasminogen-induced injury, um, and. You know, interestingly, um, and this is again work that, that's ongoing, we're able to show that the amount of plasminogen in the urine correlates with the level of proteinuria um, and albuminuria in patients with biopsy-proven kidney disease. This is, this is work from, from our um, repository at, at Mount Sinai, and we're extending this now uh, to a 1,200 patient uh, group uh, uh, through the CureGN uh, consortium. And so far, the data seems to correlate uh, pretty well. So, you know, we, we found this nice correlation between the level of plasminogen in the urine um, and uh, proteinuria for most of the histologic diagnoses, right? Lupus nephritis, IJ nephropathy, FSGS, not so much for diabetic nephropathy, but again, you know, in our initial pilot study, we only had about 20 patients or so uh, per group. So it'll be important for us to extend this with that larger cohort through uh, CureGN uh, because this, again, we think could be a promising biomarker because it's druggable, right? So not only um, would it, um, potentially tell us uh, which patients are more likely to have podocyte injury and progress, but we may be able to do something a little bit more uh, about it. Uh, and again, this is sort of zeroing in a little bit more on the focal adhesions uh, that you see last with plasminogen treatment and partially rescued by amiloride. And we're able to show again uh, that, that uh, in patients with biopsy proven FSGS, plasminogen accumulates, right? Uh, uh, in, in the glomeruli, really, in, in podocytes, uh, it, it seems more so um, in biopsy proven uh, disease. So, returning uh, to the case presentation, um, I'd mentioned that this patient had membranous nephropathy. He appeared to be in a, a remission uh, clinically. Uh, but the biomarker, the phospholipase A2 receptor level, suggests uh, that he was at a high risk, right, uh, for uh, recurrent uh, disease. And, you know, in fact, two months uh, later at a follow-up visit, he did have uh, more than four grams of protein uh, in his urine. Um, and uh, he didn't want to try anything that he'd been on before, right? Uh, you know, as I mentioned, he'd been on cyclosporin and, and, and rituximab, and he was asking about other options, right? Uh, and you know, this is one area where um, clinical trials, uh, you know, can be very helpful in, in giving patients uh, options, right, uh, for, um, you know, different therapeutics. Uh, and in this case, uh, he was a part of a study that we'd, we'd done, an investigator-initiated study um, uh, using uh, Actar gel, 
um, for uh, membranous. And we're, we're again trying to take a biomarker approach together with my, my colleague uh, Paolo Crevetti, who is uh, an immunologist uh, in our division. Uh, and you know, we wanted to identify a signature that could predict the response to this drug and, and potentially monitor uh, disease progression. You know, our recruitment efforts were hampered by the pandemic and we ended up only having about five patients in the study, but they actually all responded uh, pretty well. They, they had a reduction in proteinuria that you can see uh, here over time. Uh, and what was interesting was um, we did see somewhat of a, a, a biomarker signal with these uh, regulatory uh, T cells that may act to, you know, uh, modulate the, the immune system um, increased during uh, the time that patients responded to this drug. And this has also been reported for ituximab, right? So it's possible that monitoring these regulatory T cells uh, could be um, so a surrogate, right, uh, for the treatment response in membranous. And I think that certainly it would require some more uh, validation. So uh, just to summarize, uh, proteinuria, uh, hematuria, serum creatinine, these are really traditional uh, biomarkers in glomerular disease. Um, uh, there are emerging uh, histologic, uh, uh, serologic, and, and urinary biomarkers that are uh, being uh, developed. Um, genetic sequencing is, is taking center stage, but we do have a lot of uh, important gaps, right? We need you know, better uh, non-invasive diagnostic and, and prognostic biomarkers. We need better ways to risk stratify patients, right, for uh, heterogeneous uh, disorders that you know, are not the same for every patient, right? And we have to, to certainly uh, accept that. And precision-based approaches where we can, you know, match the treatment to individual patients is something that we haven't started to do yet. Yes, it's great that there's so much clinical trial activity ongoing and, you know, we're getting approved uh, uh, treatment options, um, but, you know, we're not necessarily leveraging all the tools we have available to us. Uh, when we look at the oncology field, um, you know, all breast cancer is not the same, right? Uh, you, you, they're they're um, complex um, somatic mutation analyses and biomarker analyses that are done to match the drug and treatment approach to individual patients, and we're just not really there. We're still saying, you know, IgA nephropathy do this, FSGS do that, and ultimately we want to become a lot more sophisticated because I think patients deserve more. So I will pause there and answer any questions you may have. Yes. Yeah, so whether genetic testing will lead to that precision approach, it's certainly a welcome step, right? Because, you know, again, as, as we, we teach our, our fellows, um, you know, two, three years ago, we would be struggling to get genetic testing for our patients. At least now we can, right? So we have those tools available to us. Um, how we use that information is the next step, right? And, and how we empower patients, right? Um, uh, you know, who are increasingly sophisticated, you know, oftentimes, you know, we've, my colleagues have reached out to me, the most interesting thing was a few weeks ago, um, where a, a patient um, got the APOL1 result from 23andMe, and contacted the primary care doctor and said, you know, I have two high-risk APOL1 alleles, what do I do? The primary care doctor said, I have no idea what this is, let me talk to my nephrology colleague, right? And then nephrologist said, I don't know either, like, let me talk to a GN specialist, right? So. You know, these conversations are increasingly being driven by patients. Um, we actually just lost our Division of Genomic Medicine chief to 23andMe, right? Uh, so I think direct to consumer. So, you know, patients may be driving this even before physicians are ready uh, to deal with the info, but I think we're, we're getting there, right? Because some of these genes, as I mentioned, are in conserved pathways uh, that may enable us uh, to um, stratify patients who may respond to specific options. So genetics is one piece, but uh, just, again, for the disorders we're talking about, there are other um, immunologic etiologies which may be separate from the genetic ones, and so we need you know, better biomarker tools in that regard as well, but certainly a welcome step. Yes, sir. Right, right. No, that's an important question, right? Uh, we talked a lot about PLA2R from membranous and, you know, what about 
appeal it to our negative membranous. And that, of course, is a very important topic. I think I'd mentioned that for primary membranous, um, PLA 2 r accounts for about 70%, right, of the cases. So, you know, the other 30%, you know, can still be primary, right? Doesn't mean that it's secondary. Uh, the thrombospondin, uh, you know, uh, biomarker is, is, again, one that's not as widely available commercially. It's available in some labs, and that accounts for maybe another 10 to 15%. Uh, but then there are others, right? Uh, there are others that, that um, have been identified and others that still have not yet been identified, right? And that's this is where we need more work because um, they may behave differently, right? Uh, and, and I think we, we do need to really get to that 100% um, because then we can appropriately, as you mentioned, utilize um, you know, the prognostic tools, right? And, and predict the response over time and maybe develop specific treatment because you know, what's important about PLA2R is, is that there is an assumption, I didn't even go into this too much, you know, most folks in the field think that this antibody is causing disease, right? You know, because it's possible that it's not, right? Possible it's just like a marker of disease and it's just going up, you know, when things are bad and coming down with treatment. That's possible. Um, but there is evidence and, you know, it, it's not that quite that strong yet, but there's a belief that it's causing the disease. And if that's the case, then you can specifically target it, right, uh, with more, you know, sophisticated means. And so, as you mentioned, if we, if we were able to tell you exactly, you know, what um, the, you know, uh, target antigen was in your case, then we could specifically in a precision-based way treat you, right? Uh, so there's still a lot more work. PLA2R was the beginning for membranous. Still a lot more work uh, to do. I think I showed, you know, that um, flowchart with some of the um, more recent ones uh, that have been developed. Because the good thing is that similar approach that the BU group uh, used to identify PLA2R is being used now. And of course, now we have more sophisticated scientific tools and hopefully we'll identify all the target antigens, right? Because then we could have more, more specific treatment. But no, that's a, that's a key point. Is that done through uh, clinical trials? Yeah, well, it, usually it's done through um, bank pathology specimens. The identification, and a lot of this work more recently is at Mayo. I mean, the BU group and some other groups uh, in, in Europe are doing this. But, you know, when a kidney biopsy is done, often um, the tissue that's not used for a clinical diagnosis is banked. Um, and, you know, patients would have to consent for that, of course. Uh, but then you can do, you know, um, you know mass spectrometry and, and other proteomics tools, right, to just identify. You have to really sift through, you know, thousands of, of proteins that are in that tissue and try to, um, you know, identify what may be causing these deposits to form in that membranous pattern, right? So it, it's a lot of work, um, but, you know, it, it wouldn't be a trial. It would more be more repository-based studies. Um, and then ultimately, you'd want to, you know, test, right, in the setting of a, a, a registry or a trial uh, to validate, right, uh, in like, you know, a blood test, if you will, right, over time. So that takes time. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, Josh. Right. Right. Right, right. Right, right. So Josh's question was, was on edema, right? And, and what's the threshold for acting on this when it's seen? And, and I would say it really depends uh, on, um, you know, how acute the onset of edema is, right? Um, you know, I, I think, and the degree of edema, right? Because we, we actually have a semi-quantitative scale from like zero to four, right? Uh, depending on, you know, the indentation and how high up the edema goes on the lower extremities, for example. You know, of course, edema can be around the eyelids and you can have fluid retention all around the body. Uh, but certainly acute onset of, of edema is a bad thing. That's never good, right? If it comes on suddenly and there's a lot of it, even subjectively, and Josh mentioned patient reported outcomes, uh, which we love, right? Uh, because, you know, we always taught in medical school, listen to the patient. They're, they're telling you what's going on, right? Uh, if a patient, you know, just says, I'm not feeling well, there's likely something going on and we just need to figure out what it is. So, I think reporting to, to physicians, uh, 
you know, changes, right, uh, is important. And, and even, you know, there are a lot of patients uh, who have uh, edema, you know, from, you know, heart failure, right, uh, like a chronically low ejection fraction, uh, and there may be a lower level of edema, or there may be from venous insufficiency, right, and, and patients with glomerular disease can have those conditions as well. Uh, so a change is what really would be um, noticeable in that regard if, if some folks have a low level of, of edema and all of a sudden now it's a lot more that's reportable. The weight, right, is important, right? We always encourage folks with, um, you know, nephrotic uh, disorders, um, heart disease, um, you know, weigh yourself, track your weight, right? Um, you know, sometimes you could be hiding the fluid retention in areas that may not be that visible or you just may not feel well. And on the scale, you know, there is a big increase in weight in a short time, you know, that's a red flag, right? Uh, so, um, you know, and, and whether it, it's necessary to do an extensive diagnostic workup, kidney biopsy, or modifying the dose of diuretics, I mean, I think there are many uh, things that, that can be done, but I think the communication is, is key. Yes. Right. Yeah, it's a good question, right? So, you know, if you identify APOL1 or, or other uh, disease causing genes, right? What about the family? What about, right, others, right? Uh, and that, that's, that's an excellent question. And, um, you know, I, I, I think it, it would be useful. Actually, a lot of these um, companies that, that are now in the nephrology space are offering just that. Right. Um, uh, the important thing, though, taking a step back, is the genetic counseling that comes with the result. Right. Because you know, I congratulate you for, for really taking the, the step of getting the testing done. Um, but again, it's not a trivial matter um, to return genetic results to any individual. Right. Oftentimes, um, there are you know mutations or variants uh, that have to be validated and explained carefully so that the individual getting the result will know what that means for them, right? So it's important the counseling, you know, be available to anyone getting the testing. Um, and the genetic counselor and the, the physician ordering the test will be the best person to guide the individual and their families around who should get tested and when, right? Because, you know, again, it, 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 it can cause for a lot of patients. We've seen this, there's a lot of anxiety, right? What does this mean? You know, I have this, you know, am I going to get sick, right? Um, and, and, you know, the, the impact, um, you know, has to be understood. And understandably, there's a lot of qualitative research trying to establish these best practices, um, you know, for genetic testing, returning results, offering testing to families. It really depends on the inheritance pattern of the gene, right? Uh, you know, some are recessive, some are dominant. Um, so, you know, I, I think, um, you know, it's really a conversation for, for you, the genetic counselor, your physician, um, and that we say for any of these uh, genetic variants. Certainly, if there is, for the, in the case of APOL1, I encourage, you know, there's no national, and this is like a big uh, issue, there's no really public health um, screening for kidney disease, right? Uh, we need that. But we encourage family members to get, you know, their kidney function uh, measured, you know, have the urine protein measured. And certainly, if there's any evidence of kidney disease, absolutely, you know, that would, you know, be for APOL1 uh, to consider seeing nephrology and, and getting a further workup. But, yeah, great question. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, the question about rebiopsying, right? So, you know, a, a biopsy happened 10, 11 years ago or longer. Should a repeat one be done? Um, and that's an excellent question because this is another reason for biomarkers where if we, you know, had a great biomarker that could predict what's happening at the tissue level, we'd say absolutely, we don't really need that biopsy, but we don't have great ones, right? So it depends on what's happening clinically, right? Um, most of the um, work around repeat biopsies is in the lupus nephritis uh, space, right, where there are different classes of lupus nephritis, and you would treat each class uh, depending, you know, on what you see on biopsy, right? <clears throat> so, and patients can have class switching, as it's called. Uh, and I think there is some evidence, um, you know, that knowing um, the repeat biopsy course may impact uh, longer term outcomes. But it really would depend on, on how uh, patients are doing, right? I think, you know, if the biopsy was done 
even 20 years ago, but there's a remission, the kidney function is normal, there's no protein, no blood, everything's looking fine. Uh, there isn't necessarily a reason to rebiopsy. However, if there's a change in clinical status, right, um, because there could be a, a different diagnosis this time, right, or kidney biopsy techniques and approaches, as I mentioned, that's changed, right? Um, you know, the tissue that was available 10, 15 years ago isn't necessarily there now, right, to stain you know, for PLA2 or DNA GB9 or, or other, you know, markers, right? Uh, uh, and, you know, we, we've had, you know, as I mentioned, there can be more than one diagnosis on the initial biopsy, right? Uh, sometimes, you know, patients uh, have some evidence of, of diabetic kidney disease, but they also have IgA nephropathy, right? And the question is, you know, what's causing the proteinuria more, you know? Um, and, you know, that, that comes up quite a bit. And we often will re-biopsy uh, to see the extent of inflammation from the IgA standpoint, it looks a lot different from the basement membrane thickening on, on diabetes. So if it'll help us, you know, guide clinical management, that's really uh, the threshold that we would have for a repeat biopsy when there's no doubt uh, of, of initial diagnosis. I'll also mention, I, I kind of glossed over the biopsy adequacy slide because we need to have at least 10, 15 glomeruli on a, a sample to consider it adequate, right? Uh, that's not always uh, the case, right? Sometimes there's a biopsy where there are no glomeruli or two or three, right? So, you know, if it was a biopsy a long time ago that was suboptimal, right, uh, in terms of quality, right? Um, um, or maybe, you know, they weren't able to do electron microscopy because there was only a little bit of tissue, right? Uh, you know, or immunofluorescence wasn't done for whatever reason. So if it'll enable us to make a more comprehensive diagnosis, again, especially if it may change management in a clinical uh, case that, that may be um, worsening, that, that would be the, the reason. Yes, Jack. That's absolutely true, absolutely true. I mean, it has to be a, I mean, renal pathology, that's a specialized uh, skill set, and it's not always a renal pathology. Unfortunately, that, that's very true. Um, even the, the biopsy being performed, um, you know, there's variability because nephrologists do them and radiologists do them. Interventional radiologists sometimes do them as well. Um, and, and again, there's somewhat of a variability in the approach. Um, I'm not saying one's better or worse. I mean, you really want to go with a higher volume lower complication, you know, rate for any procedure, right? Uh, that's really the threshold. Um, but, but yeah, no, that's a key point. Who's doing it, who's reading it uh, makes a big difference.